Just imagine, page one. Just imagine yourself in the most hostile place on earth. It's not the Sahara or the Gobi Desert. It's not the Arctic. The most hostile place on earth is the Antarctic, the location of the South Pole. North Pole, South Pole, what's the difference? The Arctic is mostly water with ice on top, of course, and that ice is never more than a few feet thick. But under the South Pole lies a continent that supports glaciers up to two miles in depth. Almost the entire southern continent is covered by ice. This mammoth ice cap presses down so heavily that it actually distorts the shape of the earth. The ice never melts. It clings to the bottom of the world, spawning winds, storms, and weather that affect the whole planet. And of all the weather it creates, the weather that Antarctica creates for itself is by far the worst. In the winter, the temperature can sink to 100 degrees below zero Fahrenheit. Cold air masses sliding down the slide sides of the glaciers speed up until they become winds of close to 200 miles per hour. When winter descends on the southern continent, the seas surrounding the land begin to freeze at the terrifying rate of 2 square miles every minute, until the frozen sea reaches an area of 7 million square miles, about twice the size of the United States. It is truly the most hostile environment this side of the moon. Just imagine yourself stranded in such a place. In 1915, a British crew of 28 men was stranded there with no ship and no way to contact the outside world. They all survived. Page 2. The Imperial Trans-Antarctic Expedition Ernest Henry Shackleton knew all about the weather in the Antarctic. In 1908, Shackleton had been the first explorer to come within 100 miles of the South Pole. On his triumphal return from that journey, he was rewarded with a knighthood for his efforts. He was a world-famous celebrity, a hero to thousands who read his thrilling book on his furthest south expedition. He was determined to try again for the conquest of the South Pole, but before he could organize a new expedition, other explorers headed for the frozen continent. In 1911, the Norwegian explorer Roald Amundsen reached the pole. Only five weeks later, Captain Robert F. Scott of England reached it, a heartbreaking second place finish, and then died on the way back to his base. All of England mourned the death of Captain Scott. Now that the South Pole had been reached, it seemed as though the age of heroic exploration was over. And yet, was it? Antarctica had never been sighted before the 19th century. Until then, it was a rumor, an undefined, unseen question mark, shrouded in fog and surrounded by ice. But it hadn't always hidden at the bottom of the world, behind a veil of frozen mist. 160 million years ago, Antarctica was part of the supercontinent Gondwana, which also included South America, Africa, and Australia. The Jurassic climate of Gondwana was summited by giant flightless birds, sharks, and freshwater fish, snails, beetles, reptiles, and proto-marsupials, all thriving again under giant ferns and trees. The supercontinent began to break apart. However, and by 60 million years ago, Antarctica had migrated south to its present location over the pole. In a mere 20 million years, the continent was covered with ice and the environment had become too hostile for most living things. By modern times, only 1% of the continent was free of ice. But not only was it too cold for most life, it was also too dry, with an annual rain and snowfall of only 2 inches per year, the same as that of the Australian outback. The polar ice cap had made Antarctica a frozen desert. The cold air masses created by this ice cap clash with the warm winds of the ocean to churn up a storm belt that surrounds the continent, making the southern ocean the most treacherous sea anywhere. The southern latitudes from 40 degrees south latitude to the Antarctic Circle at a 67 degrees south latitude long ago earned their nicknames from the sailors who dared approach the continent, the Roaring Forties, the Furious Fifties, and the screaming 60s. Countless ships have been lost in these waters. Countless sailors have lost their lives. These perilous seas kept the continent locked away until 1774. 
When Captain James Cook reached the farthest south latitude he had attained, he warmed his ship through the ice pack to reach 71 degrees south latitude and then turned north again without ever seeing the land. In 1820, a Russian Navy ship under the command of Fabian Gottlieb von Bellinghausen made the first circumnavigation and sighting of the continent. Twenty years later, James Ross became the first to pull all the way through the pack to reach land. As the 19th century ran out, more and more of the continent was mapped and described by navigators from around the world, although Antarctica claimed many ships as payment. By the turn of the century, the fringes of the continent were fairly well defined on the charts, but the interior was still an unknown wasteland of ice. Then came the race to the South Pole. Shackleton's attempt in 1908 ended when he was thrown back by terrible weather conditions only 97 miles from his goal. The prize ultimately went to Amundsen on December 14, 1911, and Scott stumbled to the pole just over, over than a month later on January 17, 1912, and there was still 5.5 million square miles untouched by man, an area 25% larger than the continent of Europe. All of England, including Shackleton, regretted losing the honor of being first at the pole. But Shackleton set his sights on a new goal, to be the first to cross the southern continent from one side to the other. There was indeed much more exploring to be done. On December 29, 1913, the London Times trumpeted, We are able to announce today with a satisfaction which shall be universally shared that Sir Ernest Shackleton will lead a new expedition to the South Pole next year. Lord Curzon, president of the Royal Geographical Society, summed up the feelings of most of Shackleton's fam. That is a task worthy to be undertaken by an Englishman, is to me quite clear. And that of living Englishmen, you are the best fitted by training, experience, and prestige to carry it out successfully. None will be found to deny. Even without such support, however, Shackleton had to go to Antarctica again because the continent pulled him like a magnet. I am just good as an explorer and nothing else, he wrote to his wife Emily. He had been bitten hard by the exploration bug. An Irishman by birth, the 40-year-old Shackleton was a showman with a hunger for polar glory. As a child, he had been something of a loner, reading adventure stories during his school days and dreaming of fame and fortune. At 16, he joined the Merchant Marine, and his first voyage took him around Cape Horn in the winter. It was his first experience of the Southern Ocean. By 1900, at the age 26, he had risen in the ranks of the Merchant Service, carrying mail and cargo around the British Empire. But he worried that his routine voyages might in fact be a dead end. Citing his years of experience at sea, he presented himself at the offices of the National Antarctic Expedition in London. In 1901, as a junior officer aboard the Discovery, captained by Robert F. Scott, he headed for Antarctica for the first time. There was no going back for Shackleton. He found his true calling. After Discovery came, his furthest south expedition in 1908. Now in 1914, he was famous enough as an Antarctic explorer to be able to raise the money he needed for his new journey. He even had the commercial smarts to form a film syndicate based on the fame of his expedition photographer, an Australian named Frank Hurley. Shackleton sweet-talked wealthy patrons, took public donations, and raised money as an advance based on future sales of film and photo rights. He also retained the rights to all crew diaries with the aim of publishing them at the end of a successful trip. With this bankroll, he was able to purchase and outfit a three-maced coal-powered barkentine called Polaris from a Norwegian firm that specialized in polar vessels. Its thick wooden hull was specially designed for plowing through polar ice packs. In some places, it was far more than four feet thick, but the wood was still flexible enough to withstand the squeezing of polar ice. The ship was capable of doing nine to ten knots under steam. In honor of his family motto, by endurance we conquer, Shackleton rechristened the ship Endurance. There was no need to call for volunteers to join the Imperial Trans-Antarctic Expedition. Almost as soon as the expedition was announced, 
5,000 would-be explorers rushed to the expedition's office on the new Burlington Street in London to join. Letters poured in from people all over the world, including at least one woman and a 15-year-old boy. Some letters were simply addressed, Sir Ernest Shackleton, London. From this flood of volunteers, Shackleton began to pick a crew. Some of the leader's choices from his team were obvious. Frank Wilde, his second in command, had been with him on his two previous journeys south and has spent a total of six years in Antarctica, logging more than 5,000 miles of sled sledging. Tom Crean, another Irishman and a tough sailor, had also been south with Shackleton before and proudly wore Britain's snow-white polar medal on his jacket. Crean had also served with Captain Scott. It was Crean who found Scott's lifeless body after the explorer's second-place finish at the pole. George Martson, the official artist of the expedition, had adventure in the Antarctic with Shackleton too. Frank Hurley, the 24-year-old photographer, had been to the Antarctic with an explorer named Douglas Mawson and was a key member because of the financial backing he, ha he could attract. Alfred Sheetham had served under Scott in the Antarctic along with Crean. A merchant marine officer na named Frank Worsley, a part Maori New Zealander who had been a sailor since the age of 16, was to captain the ship. The rest of the crew was made up of able seamen accustomed to the harsh weather of the North Sea, two doctors, a handful of university scientists, officers, a carpenter, and a cook. For seamen, the yearly salary was 50 pounds for scientists. It was 150. Some of the men had polar experience, either Arctic or Antarctic. Some of the men had never been out of England before, let alone imagined a voyage to the southern continent. But whatever their experience, whether North Sea trawler, hand or Cambridge University scientists, they knew they were in for a venture of a lifetime. Endurance now had a crew. In the ship's hold were stories of at least two years, including a recent innovation concentrated. Bovril sledging ra rations for the transantarctic run on the dog sleds. Worsley explained that this mixture was composed of lard, oatmeal, beef protein, vegetable protein, salt, and sugar. The result was heating, nourishing, and anti-scorbutic, scurvy preventing, and it was invaluable. Made up in half pounds bricks for one man's meal, it had the consistency of a new cheese and a yellow brown color but looked when boiled with water like thick pea soup. Scurvy, the depletion of vitamin C, or ascorbic acid, had always been a problem on long voyages and had contributed to Captain Scott's death en route from the South Pole. Shackleton had consulted the British Army's nutritionist, who believed in the newfangled idea of vitamins and who helped concoct the rations. Each brick consisted of 2,864 calories and was wrapped in wax paper and packed in tin boxes. The hold of the ship was loaded with them. In addition to these sledging rations were powdered milk and cocoa, sugar tea, potato, tobacco, canned meats and vegetables, liquor, flour, and a dozen and one other staples and delicacies. Shackleton believed in keeping his men well fed. The ship also carried coal, rifles, ammunition, scientific apparatus, a radio, games, books, navigational charts, lanterns, tanks, and cages for bringing back live seals and penguins, three lifeboats, and a small landing boat, a miniature billiard table, typewriters, sleeping bags, tents, matches, lumber for a hut, a bicycle, a motor-propelled sledge, and dog sleds, Two gramophones, skis, a sewing machine, hockey skates, soccer balls, the meteorologist's banjo, and the carpenter's cat, Mrs. Chippy. The plan for the Imperial Transantarctic Expedition was this. Endurance would sail from South America into the Weddell Sea, which is bordered by the Antarctic Peninsula. This peninsula was the same geological formation as the Andes Mountain, reaches north from Antarctica like an outstretched arm cradling the Weddell Sea. Having crossed the Weddell Sea, Shackleton would make landfall at the best opportunity and then set out across the continent. At the same time, the Endurance left South America, a sister ship called Aura, 
would sail from Australia and wait on the opposite, opposite side of Antarctica to pick up Shackleton and his hand-picked overland team at the end of the triumphant five-month trek. The Aurora team would also trek errand, laying down stores of food for Shackleton's group to pick up and use on their final run to the coast. The expedition's main object, explained in the fundraising brochure, was to cross the Antarctic from sea to sea, securing for the British flag the honor of being the first carried across the South Polar continent. That, in a patriotic nutshell, was the plan. That was what was supposed to happen. Many of the details of how the expedition would be carried out were unspecified. Like many explorers of his day, Shackleton was a great believer in improvisation. He would figure things out as the need arose. As long as he was well equipped and had a good crew, he was confident in his ability to pull off his plan. At her dock on the river Thames in London, endurance became a major tourist attraction. Curious sightseers came from afar and wide to view the celebrity ship and its daring crew. The attention was welcomed by the man who answered hundreds of questions. Alfred Sheetham, the third officer, found himself in conversation with some women who wondered about the dangers ahead and about Shackleton's ability to lead the men through unforeseen perils. Aye, he's a fine leader, he is, Sheetham replied. He don't run you into any danger if he can help it. But by gum, if there's danger, he goes first. In July, Queen Alexandra made a royal tour of inspection of the Endurance at the dock in London and presented Shackleton and his crew with the inscribed Bible. To Shackleton, she also gave a Union Jack, a British flag, and a silver and enamel medallion of St. Christopher, the patron saint of ferrymen. The Queen's... The Queen's sister, Empress Marie of Russia, took photographs during the royal inspection, and afterward, the eager fans who mobbed the dock gave the crew teddy bears and other mascots to carry south. The great Amundsen himself sent a telegram that read, My warmest wishes for your magnificent undertaking. By August 1st, 1914, Endurance and her crew were ready to leave for the Southern Hemisphere.